So today we're uh, continuing our series in Luke's Gospel, and we're in Luke uh, chapter 24, and um, continuing the story after Jesus has risen from the dead. So Luke 24, it's on page 1072 in the Blue Bibles, which will be in your chairs. It'll also be up on the screen, and we're starting at verse 36. So while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they did still not believe it because of joy and excitement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. My talk today is called, You Have Resurrection Power. We all face challenges in life where we feel like we could ha- need some more power. Maybe it's uh, uh, you, you hit an obstacle, an insurmountable difficulty at work, and you feel massively out of your depth. Or you hit a bump in a relationship, and it seems beyond your capacity to fix it. Or maybe it's just in the day-to-day of life, it seems to require more energy than you have, and more strength than you have at your disposal. You need more power. But there are also times when we feel specifically called by God to do something. It might be to start a business or to uh, start a new job or a new career. Or it might be uh, to, to take a risk at work to share your faith with a friend or someone you just met or a colleague or even your boss. And even as you start to think about it, you're painfully aware of your limitations and you think, if this is going to happen, if I'm going to do this, I need some more power. And today we're looking at a key promise in the Bible, a key result of the resurrection, that God's power, God's strength is demonstrated in raising Jesus from the dead. Jesus' resurrection tells you the nature of God's power, what it can achieve, how it operates. But perhaps even more surprising than that is that that promise, that that very same power that raised Jesus from dead to life is available to you is at work in you and even operating on the inside of you. That the same spirit, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, that you have resurrection power. The apostle Paul writes, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. He says, I want you to know the mighty working of his power which he exerted in raising Jesus from the dead. Woven into the scriptures is the promise of resurrection power. And that promise is not that you, you might just feel a little bit better about your life. It's a promise of a power which brings supernatural peace into the midst of the storm and actually works to change your circumstances. It's not just that you might have some kind of greater confidence, but a confidence that you have within you, a power which is undaunted by death and unfazed by any failure. A power which actually flourishes in the midst of your weakness. That's resurrection power. And whatever you're facing today, you need resurrection power. So first thing this passage tells us is that Jesus demonstrates resurrection power. What I love about this passage is is Jesus' presence with his people, with his disciples, demonstrates the resurrection power that he promises. Jesus stands before his disciples having died and risen, and they're afraid, they're shocked. He says, why are you troubled? It's me. Touch me. See my hands and my feet. See the marks. I'm real. I've got flesh and bones. And then he asks them for something to eat, and he eats a piece of fish in front of them. Jesus gives them a visual, tangible, physical demonstration of the power of the resurrection. Because the resurrection isn't... It isn't just an incident, it's an identity. It's not just an event, it's a person. 
the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus is the living, breathing, walking demonstration of what resurrection power looks like. And he shows it to his disciples, even as he promises them that they are going to be clothed with that same power from on high. It's incomparably great resurrection power. It's greater than any power that's on display today in the world. But it's also quite different to the power we see. So much of the power in our world today dominates and destroys. But resurrection power isn't like that. Resurrection power in the midst of death brings life. It turns despair into hope, tragedy into joy, wounds into marks of glory, weakness into strength, disgrace into vindication. It can take the very thing that seems to seal defeat into the very thing that God uses to work his victory. It can fulfill dreams through the very events that appear to destroy them. That's resurrection power. It doesn't destroy, it rebuilds, it revives, it redeems. It takes what is broken and it heals it. It takes what's fallen low and it lifts it up and restores it. A bruised reed, it doesn't break, and a smoldering wick, it does not snuff out. It, it comforts the disturbed and it disturbs the comfortable. It encourages the weak and unsettles the powerful. Why? Because if you've got a taste of resurrection power, suddenly you are fearless in front of every other kind of power on display in this world. What does that look like? Well, my, my little brother Paul and I uh, grew up together in Luton. I was actually born and bred in Luton. I don't talk about it much. I'm a little bit shy about it. But, um, but we grew up together and we went to the same school in Luton, quite a rough school. And I left that school and then went off to uh, study law and I ended up working as a, eventually as a criminal defence barrister and I was spending quite a lot of my time defending people accused of crimes and spending quite a lot of my time with people accused of crimes. And my little brother, has, Paul, has always been uh, much more direct and efficient than me, so he stayed in Luton, he went straight from school to spending a lot of time with people accused of crimes. Um, <laughs> not, in, not in any kind of official capacity, they were just his friends and... Uh, and, I, and he had a difficult few years, and at his lowest point, he actually got in a bit of trouble with a gang on our estate, and they were after him, and they were threatening him, and they had actually started phoning the house. So it was getting quite serious, and he wasn't sure what to do. So in the end, he thought, I've got, to, I've got to take this on. I've got to do something to try and stop this. So he arranged for a sit-down with this gang, and he went off to see them. He didn't know how it was going to be. He went into the house, and he walked into this room, and there were eight of them in a semicircle around him, and the main guy stepped forward and squared up to him, and my brother was absolutely terrified. And he couldn't even look this guy in the face. He was so scared. He was just kind of looking down. And then he realized, as he, as he looked down, that the guy who was facing him, his hands were shaking. My brother thought, oh, they're even more scared of me than I am of them. And it turns out they'd done some research. They thought my brother was a major player. He's not. I mean, he can handle himself, but he's not a major player. So they were terrified of him. And suddenly my brother kind of puts his shoulders back. He's like, right, this is how it's going to go down. Da, 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 da. Uh, and manages to sort it out. Now, I do appreciate that very few of you will be uh, sitting down with the gang this week to uh, negotiate peace. Um, I, ooh, a little bit of laughter. I hope that's the case. And, um, <laughs> but all of us will come across people who are more powerful, appear to be more powerful than us. And some of those people will be against you. They won't be for you. They'll be taking you on. They'll be criticizing you. And you can feel a lot of fear in that situation, but you don't have to be afraid. You know, the enemy doesn't want you to realize the potential of the power that you have but you don't have to be afraid of the enemy because there's a power in you that is greater than any power that this world has ever seen. And it's fascinating because the disciples are fearful even as they face Jesus. Why? Because they suffered the greatest disappointment of their lives. And disappointment distorts your perspective. But resurrection power completely reframes your reality. And when they see that, suddenly they're fearless. They're going out into every town, marketplace they can find and telling people what they've seen, that Jesus was dead and he is alive. And even when they're on trial for their lives, they say, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. The authority's like, we've got power to kill you. They're like, well, give it your best shot. How did that work with Jesus? You know, it's not just positive mental attitude. It's not just the power of positive thinking. It's not, well, what doesn't kill you might make you stronger. That's not what we're talking about at all. Jesus is walking, living proof that even what kills you can't defeat the resurrection power that is in you. That's resurrection power. 
Jesus demonstrates resurrection power. But also, you have resurrection power. You have resurrection power. The resurrection isn't just the reversal of a death. It is the beginning of a new kind of life. It's not just uh, rewinding things to the way they were before the cross. It's the beginning of a new reality. The, the resurrection isn't the end. It's the beginning of all things being renewed and restored, including you. You have resurrection power. I wonder if you feel like you have resurrection power this morning. What if you believe that this morning? Why don't you turn to your neighbor? Just encourage them. Say, you have resurrection power. Now, now turn to the person on the other side and say, don't worry, you have resurrection power too. <laughs> Do you feel better? Because it can be quite hard to believe. That power that Jesus demonstrated, that power that conquers death, is actually inside us, working through us. It doesn't always feel like that, does it, when you're on the district line on a Monday morning. Someone's <laughs> up in your face. Resurrection power, is it in me? When you're in a boardroom and, and, and someone's criticizing you, when your boss is giving you stick about your work, when you've made a mistake and feel out of your depth, you don't always realize the potential of the power that you carry. When the emails are flying in, you can't read them, they're coming in so quick. Or it can be something bigger. You had a lot of hope for something. Something, something you thought would happen, and that hope's been dashed. You know, maybe you had a dream something would happen, but it feels like the dream has died. You can't see a way through, and suddenly you're actually painfully aware of your limitations. You feel confused. You can't make sense of it. When I um, went to university, I had all these hopes, all of these dreams about what would happen. I really wanted to make an impact where I felt God had called me to be, and I went off to university in Oxford, and I quite quickly realized that I was actually entering a very different world. There was a whole new language. They talked about black tie and white tie, and something called supper, and I, I didn't really know what supper was. I hadn't come across that before. And so the first couple of weeks, I just felt completely out of my depth, out of my comfort zone. I thought, well, I thought I was brought here to shift things. I'm just hanging on by my fingertips. I'm trying to understand what's going on and try and fit in. And they don't even know I'm a Christian yet. And at the end of those uh, two weeks, I suddenly realized all the people I've become friends with, and, you know, there wasn't one Christian amongst my friendship group, and I was struggling. So I thought, well, I'll go along, I'll go along to this thing called the Christian Union. So I kind of went along. If I'm honest, quite covertly, you know, when you kind of sneak into a place, you know, just hoping no one's seen you come in, it's dead of night. And uh, I went into this room, I didn't think any of my friends had spotted me, so I got in, feeling okay, looked around the room, there were 15 people in a circle just kind of sitting there, and my heart slightly sunk, and they were holding hymn books, and they said, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to all sing together. And I looked in vain for a guitar or a piano or anything that might accompany our voices. But there wasn't anything. It was just us singing in a room, 15 people. And we didn't really have the kind of a cappella voices that sometimes you might have. And, um, and I thought, actually, I'm not sure this could be any more awkward. And then one of them jumps up and he says, the curtains are closed. We should be proclaiming this to the college. And he starts opening the <laughs> curtains. I'm like, I don't believe this. This room is next door to the college bar. And for the next 20 minutes, as I'm standing there with a the hymn book, all I can say out of the corner of my eyes, my friend's kind of looking through the window. <laughs> <laughs> the whole of my first year, I felt like I was being torn in Two. I had an amazing group of friends, but they weren't interested in church. And I felt really embarrassed about sharing my faith with them. I felt like I'd been brought here to change the culture, but I felt like the culture was changing me. I was asked even to go on the committee of the Oxford University Law Society. I thought, oh, wow, that sounds really exciting. But it met on a Sunday morning. I was being split in two. I couldn't go to church and go to this thing. It was like tearing me apart. And at the end of the first year, I was actually confused. I didn't really understand. I thought the dream had died. I was full of disappointment. I couldn't understand. All I knew is that I was out of my depth and nothing would change through me. And then I went away to a, just a, a youth holiday. And I was filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, with his resurrection power in me. And suddenly, I felt differently about things. I kind of came back to uni, and I thought, actually, the power which is in me is greater than any power I'm facing, any culture in this place. I don't have to be afraid. 
So rather than just thinking, oh, the CU is so embarrassing, I got more involved with it. I started to speak in it. We even ran events in the college where we spoke about our faith to all the other people in the college. You know, rather than just feeling embarrassed about sharing my faith with my friends, I thought, I'm going to get baptized. So I got baptized, and I invited half my year, and they came for this service and saw me publicly declare my faith. And I started to realize what was possible with this resurrection power. And then I thought, well, it's a bit unfair, really, that people can't really get involved with this law society because it, it kind of meets at the same time as people want to go to church. You've got to pick between one or the other. So I thought I'd become president of the law society. <laughs> and at our first meeting, we had to decide when the, the, the events were going to be that, that term. And I said, well, actually, I'd, I'd like to propose a change. I don't we think we should have them on Sunday mornings anymore. And everyone was like, we've had them on Sunday mornings for as long as anyone can remember. I said, yeah, I appreciate that, but I'm the president. <laughs> And it's not convenient for me because I want to go to church. <laughs> and I said, does it... <laughs> I said, does anyone have a problem with that? They went, but I want you to hear this. It wasn't anything about me. I was fearful, but resurrection power made me fearless. I was deeply insecure, but resurrection power filled me with complete confidence. I was painfully aware of my own weaknesses, but God put his resurrection power in me and said, let me see how I can use your weakness to demonstrate my strength. That's resurrection power. It changes things. And yes, you know, you might not be leading the life you'd hoped. You, you might have had hopes dashed. Your dream may have died, but resurrection power specializes in taking what is dead and bringing it back to life. You know, it doesn't ignore the pain of your loss. It redeems it. Resurrection power is not really found in pretty places. It, 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 what are the things in your life, the hopes, the dreams, that have died and which need resurrecting today? Because dead things don't stay dead when resurrection power walks into the room. And I want you to know that there is no obstacle you face which is greater than his power in you. Jesus was dead. He was in the tomb. If you're thinking of obstacles, there's no greater obstacle than that. But God chose to use the death of his son as the means by which all of creation would be redeemed and restored and renewed. You need resurrection power. You can't do it in your own strength. But you have resurrection power. And the resurrection power which is in you will transform the world around you. Jesus stands before his disciples. I love this. He says, this is what is written. Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations. Will be preached to all nations. You've got a small group of people. In a room in Jerusalem, confused, scared, the authorities are after them. They think it's all over. And the risen Jesus stands before them and says, this is written. This is what will happen. And it won't just happen here. It will happen in all nations. It's a bold promise. It doesn't look likely. They're under oppression by one of the greatest empires the world has ever seen. But Jesus has seen death and he's defeated it. He knows all things and he was there at the creation of the world and he says you're going to be clothed with power from on high. Grave-busting, death-defying power. And there might only be a few of you, but resurrection power gives you confidence in your calling and certainty about the result. And you know, he's called you in the same way. Every person here, some of you might be thinking, well, no, actually, it's a bit of an accident. I was here, you know, I had a choice, London Marathon or this. London Marathon seemed a bit like hard work. <laughs> You're not here by accident. It's not like Jesus said, oh, well, let's just let one extra in. Just sit at the back somewhere. Try to be quiet. No. You are called for a purpose. I don't know what that purpose is, but I know he has called you for a purpose. It might be to shift the atmosphere in your school or your university. It might be to change the culture in your workplace, in your boardroom, in your family, with your friendship group, in your network. He has called you for a purpose. And when God calls you and he commissions you, you can have confidence that what you begin, he will complete. 
Resurrection power tells you his purposes cannot ultimately be frustrated. They can't be. They will be fulfilled. And that's so important. It's so important for you. But you know, it's not just important for you. Often when we talk about God's power, we talk about, oh, it's God's power for me. It is for you, but it's not just for you. The resurrection power which is in you isn't only for you. Let me try and demonstrate this to you. Uh, So, a little visual demonstration. This is you. Say hi to your new self. And, um, you you know, you're... We all know what it's like. I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but as you live life, as you live life in London, you know, you're going through life. You really feel affected, almost like tainted by the world around you. You know, you make mistakes, you mess up, you have failures, and it feels like that stuff sticks to you and clings to you. And quite quickly, you can realize you're in a pretty desperate place. And what we know, what we know is that because of the cross and the resurrection, you can be completely and utterly transformed, restored, redeemed, forgiven, full of resurrection power, which brings you from life to death. But if you stop there, you've missed the potential of the power you carry because the resurrection power which is in you, which brings you from life and into, brings you from death to life, isn't only in you for you, it's in you for the world around you. And as you kind of realize the potential, the resurrection power you carry, you are pushed out into the world, into your workplace, into your home, into your school, into your university, and you transform it for God's glory and by his power. That's resurrection power. It pushes you into this world with power to transform it, power to see things change. Resurrection power will always push you out of your comfort zone to change things in the world around you. It's not just for you, it's for the people around you. And yes, your dream might have died, but sometimes things have to die so that God can resurrect them. What does that look like? Well, my parents were, uh, my dad was, was, grew up in Barnsley. He worked for a bit um, in, in, in the mines, actually. And then he, he went to Bible college. And he felt this call to preach the gospel to people in, in mainland China. So he had to learn Mandarin, but he was severely dyslexic. So it's quite hard to learn Mandarin when you find it hard to read and write English. And he met my mum at Bible college, and together they learned Mandarin, and they got ready to go and to, to, to do that stuff in mainland China. But it was the 70s. It was a difficult time in China in the 70s. They could not get into mainland China. But through a number of miracles, they managed to get into Taiwan, which was great. But they, but they saw some fruit. They had a good few years out there. But they just felt this sense of frustration. They'd felt this call to a particular place. And it hadn't been fulfilled. And so they came back. They ended up in Luton you know, with the ability to speak Mandarin. But at that time, there weren't any Mandarin speakers in Luton. <laughs> there were a few people who spoke Cantonese, but almost no one who spoke Mandarin. And for a number of years, it was just confusion. It was, I don't really make sense of that. I trust, but I don't see how that promise, that dream is ever going to be realized. It's dead. It's done. It's over. And then in 1994, actually, uh, Luton, there was a university founded in Luton. It's a very proud day in our history. I'm not sure if anyone else um, is aware of that. But it was, and Luton was, the university was founded in Luton. And they started doing a media studies kind of communications degree, which became very popular. And then in 1999, the regulations changed, and and students from mainland China could much more easily study in the UK. And lots started appearing in Luton. And so it was that the chaplain of Luton University started phoning around the churches in Luton, saying, is there anyone, anyone who can speak a little bit of Mandarin, please, because I have all these students coming to my chaplaincy, students from Chinese mainland who, who are interested in Jesus, and I just don't know what to do. So 17 years after he left Bible college, my dad is brought in to run Alpha courses with Mandarin-speaking students in Luton. They couldn't go to China, so China came to them. And actually, lots of people became Christians on these courses, and they went back to China, and friends and family became Christians, and my parents suddenly started getting invited back to China. 
All those years later, the dream had died. The promise was over. It looked like all hope had been extinguished. But that's resurrection power. It cannot be contained. It breaks through every obstacle. And it is working in you right now to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of you. What God called you to. You have resurrection power. You have resurrection power. The same power which conquered the grave lives in you. And that means that all things, all things, all things are possible. And we can see this city transformed. We can see many people in your home, your workplace, your school, your university come to know Jesus. Your dream might have died, but Jesus resurrects things. The resurrection power that brought him from death to life is at work in you. It's not over. It will be completed. And we can together see the city transformed. And the name of Jesus lifted high. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm Bear Grylls. My favourite way to start the day, the Bible in one year. That's how wild I am. Find out more at BibleInOneYear.org or download the Bible in One Year app.